humanity is constantly searching for the hardest type of money, the one with the, the highest stock to flow ratio. And over thousands of years, the, the two that really hold up are, are silver and gold, especially gold. Historically, with commodity monies, basically, you'd have different types of commodity money. So some, some cultures would use shells, some cultures would, would use, you know, uh, uh, you know, something else. And when technology improves, we figure out how to make more of that type of money. We say, okay, now, you know, our fishing boats are way better. We can go out, we can get like a ton of shells and devalue them. Right. So, so we basically humanity is constantly searching for the hardest type of money, the one with the, the highest stock to flow ratio, yeah. meaning that we can't really bring a lot new to market compared to how much is already distributed throughout the market. And over thousands of years, the, the two that really hold up are, are silver and gold, especially gold. That's the one that, like, if you look at a law, if you look at a century long chart of the estimated gold inflation rate, meaning that, you know, the amount of new gold created every year compared to the estimated amount of uh, above ground gold, uh, it's, 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 it oscillates around 1.5% per year with a very narrow band of one to 2%. It's, it's almost it's actually like impressive to look at and that's because it's it's basically a very high stock to flow ratio asset and there's a built in difficulty adjustment because as over thousands of years as you've gotten better at mining gold we've also mined the easiest deposits of gold so it's kind of like the gold is getting harder for us to mine to keep up with our technology it's the only along with perhaps silver it's the only uh, commodity that's really kind of maintained that. Now we also have super rare commodities like you know rhodium, but because they're not widely held, they're not liquid, they're not fungible enough. Um, you know they don't really serve that role as money. So so kind of gold as the highest stock to flow ratio uh, commodity has the, been the one that's been resistant to debasement over thousands of years. And so that as you kind of have this pyramid of uh, you know, almost like a March Madness chart of all these different commodities kind of competing for the top slot, and it was gold that proved to be the most resistant to debasement. Um, but the downside of gold is that it, it's, you know, it's, it's not fully portable, right? So it, it tends to be centralized. Uh, and then so we had uh, countries kind of issue, you know, they would centralize it in bank vaults and then central bank vaults and then issue notes against it. And then, of course, the sep what you can do then is end redeemability or devalue redeemability uh, for those notes relative to gold. Lynn believes that we've been in a secular bull market since the 1980s and have built a significant trade and balance. We ushered a lot of our manufacturing, and there are several feedback loops driving equity valuations higher as a result. Lynn explains how year-on-year -year data can be misleading and why, in Q3, the statistics will appear to worsen. You know, we shifted to more of a fiat-based standard. We shifted away from commodity money and towards fiat money. And that's where you after technology, bring in the second part, which is that that kind of, you know, political power, geopolitical power, kind of shifting roles of power. And the, after World War II, the U.S. had, you know, by far the world's largest navy. Uh, we had something like 40 percent of global GDP. So the United States could go to different countries and just basically make deals with them, kind of like deals you can't refuse, sort of, and say, OK, so we're going to give you protection from other entities and ourselves in exchange for you using dollars uh, as, you know, say you're you're only going to sell your oil globally in dollars or you're only going to sell this in dollars and you're going to hold your uh, a, a large portion of your reserves in treasuries and dollars. And so due to the fact that we're the large, you know, the, the Navy that can really kind of defend global supply chains and due to, you know, just that that global reach, we've been able to maintain that system. And essentially what it is, it's it's the dollar backed by oil, but not really pegged to oil. Right. So. Globally, because you know OPEC's been been you know only pricing their oil in dollars, everybody around the world thinks in terms of dollars, needs dollars if they want to import energy. And then on top of that, we layered the euro dollar market, which is basically the the debt markets. So you know that that kind of petrodollar system kind of kickstarted the network effect. But then on top of that, all these countries took out debt in dollars. Several factors could affect the CPI, including increased commodity demand globally. Some commodities may stay at new levels and might not fall much overall. CPI metrics are relatively inaccurate due to quality adjustments and lack of important factors like housing, healthcare, and food. The Fed plans to overshoot its 2% inflation target for a period of a few months. The question will be how difficult it will be to reduce it. Lynn Alden also discusses the impacts of growing base money and stimulus as we just had the largest year-on-year -year growth of the money supplied since World War II. So and really, if you look back since the global financial crisis, there has been a shift. So for a while, gold reserves of countries were going down 
the UK famously sold some of their gold, you know, roughly at the bottom, like 20 years ago. Um, and really ever since the global financial crisis and then in the years that followed, there's been kind of a re-emphasis on gold uh, around the margins uh, uh, as a neutral reserve asset. And so I think that, uh, you know, if anything, this might have accelerated that to some degree. Um, and so I think that that trend is, is still going to be intact where, you know, they'd rather buy gold than continue accumulating treasuries. And they can accumulate both, but they can accumulate more gold than treasuries rather than literally sell gold and, and buy treasuries, right? So I think that, that the share of gold, both through a combination of purchases and through appreciation of that gold relative to dollars, uh, is likely to make those reserves a larger share of their effective assets over time. According to Lynn, gold can be a hedge against negative real yields and the timing for the next gold move will track real rates. She thinks that we've been in a free-floating currency rate system since the 1970s, and we may be entering another dollar bear market. The global demand for dollars is tied to oil, and there is a regular cycle based on fiscal policy. The dollar can have a detrimental effect on other currencies, with Turkey and Lebanon being recent examples. Something I've been writing about since 2020 is that the reserve system and the global payment system is becoming more diversified and is likely to continue to becoming more diversified. And what I mean by that is when people talk about, you know, say moving past the current dollar standard, they're saying what fiat currency is big enough to replace it? And my answer is none. There's no, you know, the yuan's not big enough, the euro's not big enough. Um, uh, it, there's no individual fiat currency anymore big enough because that was a unique situation. Back in the, you know, after World War II and then in, in the beginning of the 70s, when you're 35 or 40 percent of global GDP and you're the biggest commodity importer, then you're big enough to be the heart of the whole system. Whereas if the biggest economy in the world is only 20 percent of, of global GDP, uh, you know, it's really hard to be the, the one currency that backs the whole system. And it even has costs for that country because they run, you know, the U.S. runs these huge structural trade deficits basically in order to support the system. So we have advantages from the system and we have disadvantages from the system. Uh, and so as we go forward, my, my expectation was that, you know, due to increasing technology, including what we just talked about with, you know, digital payment channels and things like that. And then two, the increasing recognition that treasuries are going to persistently yield negative real yields, and negative inflation adjusted yields going forward, that countries are going to want to diversify more, both in terms of their payment channels and their, you know, their big pie chart of assets that they hold to backstop their national reserves you know, how concentrated do they want those to be? And and what percentage do they want in fiat currencies? What percentage do they want gold and other assets? And so I think over time, we are going to see a more bifurcated world. You have United States, you have, you have China. Those are kind of the, the, right now the, the two biggest economies. You also have, you know, the rise of India. Uh, Europe's still a very large player. Uh, and to the extent that different countries can make alliances, Right. So if, if Russia and China can hold some sort of alliance between themselves, in some ways they shore up each other's weaknesses because, you know, China is a, a manufacturing powerhouse. They're decent with technology, but they're short commodities. They need to import commodities in most cases, whereas Russia is kind of the opposite scenario. Right. So they're, you know, they're they're good in aerospace technology, but they're, you know, they're not a large manufacturing hub, but they do have commodity exports. Gold is kind of the, the main asset right now, right, that, 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 that they can turn to. And then they're, you know, down the road, if something like Bitcoin gets bigger, they can explore that. Some of the small countries can already explore that. But right now, even the gold market's, you know, barely big enough to, you know, increase its share uh, unless the price goes up quite a bit, right? Let alone what would have to happen to Bitcoin if, if that was kind of used in any sort of meaningful way there. And so I think we're going to see more diversification and more emphasis on neutral reserve assets like gold. Long-term Lin expects the dollar to decline based on its historical cycles. Commodities, including gold, are at historically cheap levels, and the recent sell-off in commodities has made oil and copper more attractive. Gold appears fairly valued currently, but the trend is going higher. Periods of negative or low bond yields are perfect environments for gold, and most investors still have little or no exposure to gold. Silver could easily outperform in part because it's such a small market. Any inflows could have outsized effects on the price. If there is an explosion in electric vehicle sales, we could see silver and the base metals used in the electrical grid move much higher. This is an excellent environment for gold and other scarce assets.
So I, I am still bullish on, on gold as an asset. Uh, I have been since 2018. There's obviously periods of time where it's better or worse than others. Um, I do like Bitcoin as well uh, as a more volatile but potentially higher returning uh, play of a, along similar lines. I also like, um, in general, commodity companies because even though <coughs> – even though we've seen like a, say a spike in oil prices, oil stocks are still, you know, kind of priced for lower oil uh, than, they, than it currently is. It kind of assumes that this spike is transitory. It's going to come back down. Uh, whereas I think the longer term kind of pricing for a lot of these natural resource stocks is still very attractive. Same thing for pipelines and same things for value stocks in general. So I think a diverse basket is still kind of a useful way to play it.